Hello everyone, this is Jason Kendall. Welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Tonight we're going to finish off our discussion about white dwarfs and how they become novae and type 1a supernovae. So once again we begin with this interesting graphic which cannot exist in reality because if a white dwarf were that close to the earth, the earth would be shredded because a white dwarf is the mass of the sun but the size of the earth. And that actually would have such incredible gravitational tidal forces on the earth, it would destroy it. But not before the incredible intensity of light from the ultraviolet light fried the earth, boiled the oceans, and made the, uh, the atmosphere boil off into space. So lots of things bad would happen if you came near a white dwarf. So let's see what those things can be because white dwarfs are really interesting things. So we learned last time that white dwarfs are the remnant stars that the, we've learned over, over the last couple of lectures actually that they're the cores of big stars. Stars less than the mass of the sun by about ten times, eight times the mass of the sun. And if a white, those are the cores that beget, the stars that begin with less than eight times the mass of the sun. The core itself is supported against gravity by electron degeneracy pressure, which we discussed in excruciating detail last time. And if they're smaller than four solar masses, the star is, if it begins as less than that, then the end white dwarf is made of carbon and oxygen. But if it's between four and eight solar masses as an initial star, then it becomes an oxygen neon magnesium white dwarf, which is much more dense and more massive. We also learned last time that there is a maximum limit to the mass of a white dwarf called the Chandra Sekhar limit at 1.44 solar masses. And this is because that if you keep packing mass on top of a white dwarf, it gets smaller and smaller, and the electrons in it have to go faster and faster and faster, and eventually they have enough energy such that their, their kinetic energy is almost at the speed of light. And once it becomes the speed of light, then that's the limit. And it, 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 it does bad things, which is what we'll discuss today. And the radius of the uh, of the of the of them is about an Earth radius, or about two percent that of the Sun. The density is over a mil roughly about a million grams per cubic centimeter, and the escape speed is about two percent that of the speed of light. So you got to leave them. The important thing is is that the white dwarfs themselves, because of the electron degeneracy pressure, do not shine by nuclear fusion or even by gravitational contraction. They're not going to contract anymore they're staying that same radius forever. So they, sh they shine because the protons and helium nuclei and carbon, oxygen, neon, and magnesium nuclei that are inside the white dwarf, those things are still hot and they would have an equivalent temperature of almost billions of degrees inside. More like tens of millions or hundreds of millions of degrees, but still that's really hot and any hot gas glows and so what we see is the residual heat of those things glowing. The electrons themselves compri comprise the lattice-like, almost brick-like structure uh, that keeps everything up, and they are effectively at temperature zero, but if they expanded, they'd be very, very hot. But because they're collapsed together by electron de in, in a degenerate state, they are effectively have no temperature. So what it leaves is the 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 uh, the nuclei the, the the nuclei of the of the whatever what were atoms in the center of all the res remnant elements. So let's see what happens. As a white dwarf evolves, it will cool. So if you since it has no energy source, no fusion or anything, it cools off and fades away. And there's a white dwarf cooling sequence on the HR diagram where it starts in the hot upper left and going to cooler lower right. And eventually they just get dimmer and dimmer. And the eventual state for a lone, solitary, isolated, old black dwar white dwarf is called a black dwarf. And a black dwarf will never happen until they, they take so long to cool off that it would be trillions of years, tens of trillions of years before a white dwarf would become a black dwarf. And the universe is only 13.6 billion years old, so it's not old enough for any black dwarfs to exist. But we're not talking about black holes, we're talking about black dwarfs, which would be old. And those would only happen in the deep, deep, deep future of the universe. They do not exist yet today. So what can exist today as the end result of a white dwarf is a nova. And so novas are stars, traditionally, there's just some star sitting in the sky that all of a sudden flares up extraordinarily suddenly and then dims back down. That's called a nova. And it'll, glow, it'll increase in luminosity by, say, 10,000 times, and then it'll 
fade away slowly. And what exactly is happening with this? Uh, well, in this graph, we're seeing a star, and then afterwards, it's very, very bright. And then we see the luminosity has grown up to about 10,000 times the luminosity of the sun, assuming that it was about just a little less than the luminosity of the sun when it started. And this nova state will last uh, tens of days, maybe up to 100 days as it fades away. And then why it's called a nova is that that means new star. So, or no, or if you like it, it, it could also be in Spanish, it doesn't go. Well, it actually does go. This is a new star, a nuevo star. And that's another way of looking at it. Now we can think about a, uh, another, a more recent star or an exactual data for a star. This one happened in 2015. This is Nova Sagittarius, Sagittarii no, 2015 number two. So this would have been the second Nova appearing in the constellation Sagittarius in 2015. And as we look at this thing, it got really bright up to almost, according to some of the measurements, by in visual, the, the purple dots are V, meaning Johnson V that we discussed earlier on. And that Johnson V magnitude was highly variable, up to a magnitude or two over a couple of days, even inside a day or so. And so this was a very variable uh, nova emission that was just visible to binoculars. And over the course of a day or so, it, goes, it went from sixth magnitude up to fourth magnitude and back and forth and back and forth very rapidly during its nova outburst time. And then it faded away. It then gradually, it then rather rapidly faded down to 13th magnitude and then came back up. So there must have, this is an interesting, interesting element of a, of a, what we call a nova. And prior to that, it must have been a roughly 13th magnitude. And this data comes from the, the, uh, the, the uh, American Association for Variable Star Observers, and that's the AAVSO.org, and the link across the bottom. Oh my goodness, if you want to go look at it, you can. And I just compared it visual observations, because there were lots of visual observations by people using telescopes and binoculars. It was bright enough to see in binoculars in the constellation Sagittarius. Now, why exactly it has this shape is rather interesting. The strong dip is probably likely due to dust interactions that would have blocked the light. And then finally, once that got dissipated or blown away, then we could see the underlying bright material under it as it brightened back up. So it got as bright as fourth magnitude, then the dusty material that, that it emitted cooled off rapidly and then was able to, but then needed to be redispersed, that blocked the light and dropped it down to 13th or even 13 and a half magnitude, then came back up as the dusty material was dispersed. So there was a lot of emission of stuff that then blocked the light that then we could then see later. So this is what's happening. So a white dwarf, that is part of a semi-detached binary system can undergo repeated novas. So we have the white dwarf on the left that's emitting in the nova category. And this artwork is by David Hardy at Peapark. Uh, but we have a, maybe a, a red giant that's very, very, very close. And as it's close, material, uh, as the red giant expands, uh, the gravitational pull from the white dwarf, which is just as big as the, or at least not just as big, the gravitational balance point between the white dwarf and the red giant gets to the point where it's more the tipping point, to tipping point towards the white dwarf. And because the two of them are spinning and orbiting each other rapidly, it goes off in this stream-like structure that you see and forms a disk around the white dwarf. And occasionally enough material builds up on the surface of the white dwarf that all of a sudden it explodes catastrophically in a runaway thermonuclear explosion on the surface because mostly the gas that's falling on it from the red dwarf, from the red giant, would be hydrogen. And so that hydrogen can do thermonuclear fusion on the surface of the white dwarf rapidly and blow material out. Now, if the star is big, uh, then, it, then the white dwarf nova can actually blow some of the star away. And that's why we might see, say, the, uh, what, what we saw in the previous nova where there was a big blockage. So you could have a bunch of dusty material that then comes off and cools rapidly, blocks the light, then gets blown away by the, by the energy provided, put into it by the nova later. So... A white dwarf can be part of that, and so we have the mass. So let's look at it in a diagrammatical format. So we have a main sequence or red giant companion. 
uh, if it's main sequence and you get multiple repeated novas and they're really, really close. So they're semi-detached, meaning their orbital rotation as they orbit their common center of mass. It might take hours or less than a day or so for them to orbit each other. So they're orbiting rather rapidly around each other. And then the mass would, if it's, if, if the matter is on the near side to the white dwarf, is just close is is close enough such that the gravitational pull of the white dwarf is greater than the gravitational pull of the rest of the of the main sequence companion, then the matter can fall off of there and go towards the white dwarf. So really, these two objects have the same rough mass, uh, or at least comparable masses, and all you have to do is make the main sequence star swell up just enough so that the balance point for the material at the top edges of the main sequence star are just enough so that it can fall towards the white dwarf. So it's like being on a tipping point, and the tipping point is right where the mass transfer stream begins. And once it lands on the accretion disk, there's a hot spot on that accretion disk where the material lands on it, and the accretion disk then goes round and round and round, and eventually accretes onto the white dwarf, which then explodes as a nova. And that's called a dwarf nova. And there's outbursts that have occurred in history. One of the brightest ones, not the one we saw in 2015, but there's been many. There's, there's one a year or so that comes around. There's at least a few a year. That one in 2015, that was early, and then happened, that was the second one. G.K. Perseus was a nova in 1901 that occurred and became easily one of the brightest stars in the sky. And we can see the dusty material from this image of that nova that was taken recently by Adam Block at Mount London Sky Center at University of Arizona up at Kitt Peak. So this, this nova then, can, uh, when it occurred, it became extraordinarily bright. How bright is this bright? The, out, the American Association of Variable Star Observers has historical data that goes back to 1901 about this object when it first became visible. It got up to magnitude, visual magnitude of zero. Visual magnitude of zero means it was brighter in some places than the planet Venus, or at least Venus was the only thing brighter than it. The Venus, the moon, and the sun were the only things brighter than this star in the sky. So it was incredibly bright. And people really would notice it because that's something that was brighter than every other star in the sky and would come out first at sunset in the constellation of Perseus. And where Perseus is very far away from this, uh, maybe it had to have been relatively nearby the sun because, well, not too far from the sun because look at how easily it was observed. So we have this great, easily easy observation pattern for GK Perseus. And it grew from about eighth magnitude down, or at least it grew to zero magnitude, and then dimmed back down rather rapidly to about 12th or 13th magnitude. But now look at what's happening on the right-hand side. That initial nova was because of a huge outburst on the surface of the white dwarf that happened as a result of mass, huge amounts of mass transfer. And that's called a nova event on the left-hand side. But now we get the dwarf nova event because now the stars are closer together as a result of this interaction, because they're semi-detached, and stuff keeps falling down on top of it. So we see these spikes that started happening around night, uh, the latter part of the 1960s. And we can see the events happening maybe around 1964 is when they started happening again. And the star, the, the, the nova is mostly quiescent at a magnitude 13. And every couple of years, it does an outburst. And it gets up to like 11th or 10th or even 9th magnitude uh, for a while. And so this has become recently, since the 90s, something that people like to study because dwarf novas are kind of cool. So the American Association of Variable Star Observers, these people love to find stuff. And so you can see all those data points happening with uh, studying this very bright dwarf nova. That's kind of neat in the constellation Perseus. So when it's, able to, when it's able to be seen, then we see an outburst, lasts a few days, the last few weeks or so and then it dims back down. So that's where those spikes are as the as material piles onto the white dwarf, explodes, but then it happens again because as the main sequence star is getting closer, because as this stuff goes out, there's like this dusty, gassy cocoon around all of around both stars. And that provides drag on them, which means that as they orbit each other in that gassy, dusty cocoon, they actually slow down in exactly the same way the, the, the uh, International Space Station has to fire its rockets, even though it's 250 miles up from as it orbits the Earth, 
every couple of months it's got to fire its rockets to get above because there's just enough Earth's atmosphere to drag the International Space Station down. So as these two stars orbit each other, there's a lot of gas and dust there, and so they spiral slowly in towards each other. This could be interesting in maybe 10,000 years. Stay awake. All right, so what can happen if you added enough matter? So that we now can see that matter can be transferred from one star to the surface of a white dwarf. What happens if you have a really big one, like that's really close to the Chandrasekhar mass of 1.44 solar masses? Above that, the electron degeneracy pressure we know would fail. So it can't balance the gravity, and so therefore it must collapse. So if you added enough matter, then it would override it. If then the density would rise because the bat, because there's no way to stop it because electron degeneracy pressure can't stop it. However, the temperature is not increasing. Eventually, the density gets so incredibly high that the carbon and oxygen nuclei become hot enough on their own to burn and do explosive uh, explosive detonation of nuclear fusion inside of there. And that generates the heat. And then since there's no pressure to slow the collapse, because the electron degeneracy no longer works, the extra heat leads to more fusion. More fusion means to more heat. More heat means more fusion and so on. And it's a runaway, out of control, catastrophic nuclear explosion. And that makes a huge new supernova type. And that fuses all the light elements in the white dwarf into iron and nickel. And the white dwarf itself gets completely consumed in this explosion and it forms what we call a type 1a supernova. There's nothing left behind when this happens. The white dwarf completely explodes and is responsible for a huge amount of iron in the universe. So to summarize, we talked about supernova before, but let's look at the two different types. In the top type is the one we're talking about now. We have a binary star that are very close together. One of them becomes a uh, turns into a white dwarf and a planetary nebula, and eventually the other one evolves to become a red giant. And that then forms an accretion disk. The, the white dwarf grows and grows and grows in mass, and eventually it detonates and explodes. We'll compare that to a core collapse supernova, which is what we talked previously, which is an isolated star that fuses hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to oxygen, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, and then finally iron. And eventually there's a core, the, the iron can't withstand it because it takes energy and then the core collapses that forms a shock wave at the bottom which then explodes the core, the, the star, in a massive explosion. What's interesting in terms of the light, how what you see in the sky, is that type 1a supernovae, uh, they, they, they're distinct in a couple of ways. One, they're light curves, and two, they're spectrum. But we can also then remember that there's a huge amount of neutrinos that occur from a core collapse supernova. Remember that the, from our previous discussion about those kind of supernovae, you get an enormously high density area that produces an enormous amount of neutrons. And that means that the luminosity of the star in neutron, in neutrinos, not neutrons, but neutrinos now, as a result of these neutron-rich uh, 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 nuclear fusion reactions, the luminosity of the star of a core collapse supernova far exceeds that of the light in neutrinos. So neutrinos are much, much more energy comes out. In fact, more than 99% of all the energy of a core collapse supernova comes out of neutrinos. Whereas with a white dwarf, it's almost all in the light and the kinetic energy. So there's not as much in terms of neutrino impact because of how fast it occurs and what the nuclear fusion is that's occurring. It's happening all inside the entire white dwarf at once. So there's not a lot of time for it to do anything except explode, whereas with a core collapse supernova, there's, there's the relentless pressure of gravity that pushes it and creates faster and faster reactions. So they create different appearances. So white dwarf supernovas are not the same thing as a core collapse supernova. They don't emit as many neutrinos. But also, white dwarf detonations don't have a massive hydrogen envelope. So we have two different kinds of supernovae. And they are distinct by their light curves and their spectra. And if we look at type 1, which are, the, which are the white dwarf types, which is the purple line, they get really, really bright, and then they fade. But type 2 supernovae get really, really bright, have a plateau, 
and then fade again. And that's because type 2 supernovae, they create all sorts of, of, of elements that are much, much, much heavier than iron because of the, of the neutron-rich environment in the core that's occurring as a result of all this. There is no such thing for type 1As, so they just get really bright and then they fade away. The other type 2s are driven by nuclear, uh, few, well, nuclear fission, which is radioactive decay of elements. So that's what the difference is between the two light curves. Uh, so then to look at again at the process, imagine then you start with two stars as in a binary pair. They're really, really close. They're two normal stars. And then one of them becomes a red giant. As one of them becomes a red giant, then it dumps material onto the secondary star because, well, it's a red giant. And eventually they expand and become engulfed in a common envelope. Once they become a common envelope, because the red giant is done, the core is a white dwarf that's sitting over there, and the other star then gets more massive. So now we've got a white dwarf sitting there with a much more massive common envelope, and then the other star has now been made more massive and therefore burning faster, and that's the yellow star now. And then it spits off the outer layers, but now we've got two stars that are really close, and the, now the yellow star is a rapidly evolving main sequence star, and the other one is now a white dwarf. Next thing that happens is that then that star becomes an aging, aging, aging red, red giant star. It starts to swell up even as it exits the main sequence, and then it dumps material onto the white dwarf now, not onto a companion star. And then that, it, it reaches the Chandrasekhar limit, it explodes, and either the, the white dwarf is completely destroyed or the other star somehow survives, but there's, it's still an open set of debate whether or not the companion star actually survives the explosion, but the white dwarf certainly does not survive. So that's the progenitor sequence cartoon for a type 1a supernova. What's interesting is that they all happen as a result of, of this specific ignition pattern. And I found this, which is really interesting, at the Flash Center for Computational Science at the University of Chicago. So they've been done extraordinary computer simulations of what exactly happens inside of a white dwarf detonation. And if it's a gravitationally confined detonation, you get just some nucleus that happens. Some little seed of the reaction happens in one place deep inside the core of the white dwarf. And when it does, that bursts out because it's not going to be exactly at the center. It'll be a little bit offset. And because it's a little offset, then it makes a jet. And that jet then plows through the outer material, as we can see, the thermonuclear plume as the reaction is occurring we get this plume of superheated gas that's occurring in the center where most of the action is actually happening right at that nuclei point, nucleation point. But the, but the reactions do begin to occur as the density and temperature rises catastrophically in the plume that's growing. Then the plume breaks through the surface, but the white dwarf has 2% the speed of light to escape from it. So this gas cannot escape. So it then goes into orbit around, even, even as it gets hotter and hotter, and the reaction uh, continues faster and faster. The yellow, the blue is where it's hottest. And then the, but then the plume has to then stay on near the surface. So it scoots around to the other side and forms a secondary plume where it all occurs at once. And that leads to another catastrophic reaction, which now we're going to change the scale and look only at that plume. And that plume then is the thing that goes and destroys the rest of the star completely. So this is a computer simulation that shows the detonation of a white dwarf, and all of this happens within about a second and a half, or maybe two seconds. And remember, the original size of white dwarf is about the size of the Earth. So something the size of the Earth all explodes catastrophically all at once. Makes the, makes the beginning of Superman's uh, world and Krypton look like nothing. Maybe this was Krypton. Maybe Krypton was actually the surface of a white dwarf. Dun, 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 dun. Don't tell DC Comics. Anyway, so here's the idea behind a type 1a supernova. Dumps on it. Before the explosion, they were separated very tightly. And then after the explosion, a few days later, you got this massive, massive, massive amount of stuff coming off. Probably the original, the, contri the contributing star, the big, older, other main sequence star, probably gets destroyed. And then the debate whether or not it gets destroyed or not. But certainly the material then goes out into space and forms other, other stars, right? Because that's where we get most of our chemical elements from, is from the 
from supernovae events. And so this will form iron, cobalt, nickel, and many other elements that are very heavy, uh, heavier than iron, in a fraction of a second. Well, remember the car but that most white dwarfs are simply carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and some magnesium or some neon. So they don't start off with the heavy elements that was such as silicon and even an iron core. No, that all happens all at once. So when the, the materials are made inside of the white dwarf catastrophic supernova, those things happen quickly and rapidly, and the, you don't get that, that photoionization or the, or the de photo disintegration that you find with the, with the core collapse supernova. So you get some of your, much of the iron gets created in the, a, a huge amount of iron gets created in this because, well, that's what you can make and you don't make anything else and the iron does, doesn't have the chance to be destroyed by the energy of the light. So these metal, the, so the supernova ejecta then mixes with the interstellar gas that makes other stars that may use these metals. I remember astronomers call metals anything with a, with an atomic number greater than helium, and that becomes successive stars. Generations become more metal rich. So everything that we know, all the iron and silicon and phosphorus and carbon and oxygen comes from exploded dead stars. And all of this must have happened more than five billion years ago prior to the existence of the sun because we know the earth is four and a half billion years old and we know the sun is 4.567 billion years old. So that's interesting to note that the solar system had to have been formed from gas already enriched by a previous generation of these massive stars. Some of them might have been white dwarfs with the type 1a supernova and some of them might have been core collapse. Interestingly enough though, we have a fascinating thing about type 1a supernovae because of the Chandrasekhar limit. They can be used as distance indicators. Now if we look at this, this is a supernova that happened in a very distant galaxy in 2002 that was captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. We see this incredibly distant galaxy and we see a little red dot and that little red dot is a supernova event that happened in that galaxy. So we can look for the light curve of supernovae in distant galaxies because if we track them, we see they get brighter, brighter, brighter in a particular curve, a typical light curve, and then they dim out. So type 1a supernovae, because binary stars are more common than massive stars, you don't have to have as massive a star. So type 1a supernovae should be more common then core collapse supernovae because binary stars are more common and white dwarfs are more common that are less than eight where the star begins of the eight solar mass star. To get a core collapse supernova, you need stars that are 10 or 15 solar masses and those are really rare. But, but smaller stars are less rare. So distant galaxies, you probably think that they're supernovas type 1a. And here's another example of one that happened in 2002. In, in the object in the galaxy NGC 1309. And here's one that happened in the, in the Whirlpool Nebula in 2005. There's another one in 1994. And here's one that happened in 2014, in January of 2014. I actually saw this with my own telescope. Uh, and that's, as you can see, you just track it around uh, from the days and times. We see that it gets brighter. It starts at magnitude 11, the brightest, and then it goes from it goes it gets to its brightest at 11, and then goes back down to 17. So this particular supernova was quite nearby, at 13 million light years away, and we actually use this to help us understand more about that galaxy. And there it is in January of 2014. I took this with the Micro Observatory, which is a free online telescope service, and the supernova is that little star right there not is that's that's in the disk of the galaxy m82 now because they all have the same property that these type 1a supernovae all happen because they have what's called the straw that broke the camel's back just when you start increasing the mass above 1.44 solar masses as a as a white dwarf Therefore, they must all get to the same brightness at their peak because it's the same exact process that creates them. So let's say we measure a whole bunch of these supernovae in distant, distant galaxies. Well, because of the, the expansion of the universe, which we'll talk about later, the light curves get stretched in time. When you take that effect into account, 
for all of these supernovae, they, exa they have exactly the same light curve. So we know they're all type 1a supernovae because we know the type, this type of light curve for a type 1a supernova. And so we know that all of them get to the same brightness at their peak. And this is a major study of many type 1a supernovae done by Kim et al. back in 1997, uh, according, and this is an Astrophysical Journal article. And they looked at how long it took in terms of days, and, and they looked at the brightness in the, uh, in the B magnitude. So that's a pretty standard brightness uh, in the Johnson B to look for them, because it's nice and broad filter and easy to, easy to see these galaxies. Interestingly enough, if we really do a deep survey, such as Reset Al did with the Hubble Space Telescope, we see many supernovae. We can see little bright dots in each one of these galaxies, and we see 04 and 05, which is the year in which they did their work. And then we go and look from 2002 to 2005. We see multiple little bright stars embedded inside of each of these galaxies, and we can find gal example after example after example. And fascinatingly enough, if you use this supernova, because they all get to the same brightness at their peak, you can use them as a standard candle, just like we can use Cepheid variable stars to get, to get standard candles. We can use type 1a supernovae to get standard candles to these distant galaxies. And in so doing, we can then use this supernova to then measure the expansion of the universe, because that's the last step in order to figure out the expansion of the universe. We can then calibrate to extraordinary distances because they're really bright. We know exactly that they get to the same exact brightness at their peak, and if we can catch them at their peak, then we can then measure the redshift of the galaxy in which they're embedded, and once we do that, we can measure the rate of expansion of the universe because we know exactly how bright they are. So this is an incredibly fortunate thing for this Chandrasekhar limit because without it we couldn't do this. So if we look at type 1a supernova on a Hubble's, Hubble diagram which shows the all these dots, these data, these black dots show that how fast the galaxy is rushing away from us, meaning the distance, and the distance was determined using the type 1a supernovae, and the velocity of recession is what on the y-axis, we then have a Hubble diagram which shows that the farther away an object is, the faster in megaparsecs, the faster it's rushing away from us. And that line that interpolates it shows the rate of expansion of the universe as measured using type 1a supernovae. And so the Supernova Cosmology Project, where there were two major projects that were looking for the expansion rate of the universe using these supernovae. And if we look closely, we find that there is a group that would look for some of them in 1996, and the Supernova Cosmology Project measured the expansion rate of the universe, uh, that's what the red dots are, and measured well, the, the brightness of the supernova at its peak for a given redshift. So redshift is left and right, and brightness is up and down. And we can see that the red dots show how bright they were at peak, and if we fit the curve, with the best fit curve to this data, we find that the universe is made up of 28% normal matter and dark matter and 72% dark energy according to supernovae, which is interesting because this is also done by the Hi-Z search and the Supernova Cosmology Project both determine the same thing and determine that the universe itself is accelerating in its expansion. And that's what we mean by an accelerating expansion, is that notice most of the, most of the dots lie right above it, with those, there's vacuum energy, which is the dark energy, without dark energy is below, and the average of these things, or the best fit to this data, says that the universe is expanding with dark, with some dark energy. So if we actually put this all together, we can then determine the history of the universe as well as its future, and we find that ago the universe was 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 actually rushing away fast slower than it is today, and that's what those curves mean. The best fit curve says that the Earth, the the not the Earth, the universe was expanding slower, and then it started to accelerate in its expansion about five billion years ago, and now it's accelerating much, much, much faster as time goes on. And this is a graph by Perlmutter that was used in Physics Today back in 2003 after they discovered this.
This led to the team by Pearl Mutter, the Supernova Cosmology Project, and Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese with the Hi-Z Supernova Search Team. They looked for the expansion of the universe using these Type 1a supernovae. In fact, this was one of the main reasons for the launching of the Hubble Space Telescope was to actually figure out the actual expansion rate of the cosmos. And they used these Type 1a supernovae, both of these teams did, in order to discover the expansion rate. And they would be going up to the mountaintops and looking for trying to get the trying to get spectra on a supernova that they found using the Hubble Space Telescope uh, just nights before, and then they were hunting for it. And so, as one team would leave the scope, the other team would be arriving. So it was an active competition, and it was only because of some miscommunication between members of the team that member that they have a joint Nobel Prize because both teams were competing actively with each other and eventually both teams then discovered that not only was the universe not decelerating in the expansion but it was actually accelerating so two different teams using different data and different methods of reducing that data however both using looking at type 1a supernovae both discovered the expansion rate that that the that the supernova were dimmer than expected and the reason they were dimmer than expected was because now we're rushing away from them faster than we used to. So that meant the universe is bigger now than expected. Then, therefore, the universe is accelerating. That was the subject of their Nobel Prize award in 2011. So that's our big deal with respect to these white dwarf type stars. White dwarfs, which are really interesting in and of themselves, which form a fascinating end state to stars and form really beautiful things to go observe called novae and dwarf novae. Maybe a dwarf nova. That's why people are looking at that one in Perseus, because maybe a dwarf nova that's bopping itself off every few years, maybe it'll turn into a nearby type 1a supernova. And that's why the interest is so, that's why there's so many data points of people looking at it, because maybe it'll bop off and become one of these and help us better understand type 1a supernova which will help us better understand the expansion rate of the cosmos. So it's a very rich area of research, is understanding exactly what detonates a Type 1a supernova. All right, that's enough for this time, because holy mackerel, there's a ton of things there, and we'll see you soon.